And I'd like us to look at those words there. Purge your conscience. This will be about the purging of the conscience. I always feel a little difficult here preaching about something which uh, I've written about and the material is still in print. And I think I first wrote a small work about the conscience in the late 80s and in booklet form it's been in print pretty well all the time since and it's available and now I want to preach on this subject I feel I ought to do so but somehow you always feel a little strange however I think it's so very important that we talk about purging the conscience the conscience everyone of course has a conscience now it's not all that popular to say that nowadays atheism is anxious to do away with the concept of conscience. There is no such thing as the conscience, it's said. This is just an invention of past society, of religious societies, of Christianity in particular. It's an invention. And that point of view is becoming very popular in our day. What is the conscience? Well, says atheism, it's a fiction, it's a myth, it's a remnant from the time when society brainwashed people to believe that this was wrong, and that was wrong, and this was wrong, and something else was wrong. And there were all kinds of invented taboos, which, says atheism, of course I'm generalising, which are out of date, and they're past. Now we know better. Now we're an adult race and we've developed greater sophistication. And many, many of the things that were once deemed wrong are no longer deemed wrong. Things have changed. The rules have been rewritten. The moral order has been turned upside down. And yet, to the embarrassment of atheism, people still have an inner sense of right and wrong which conforms more to the old values than to the new values. And this has to be explained away. It cannot be said, says atheism, that these are standards, absolute standards of morality, written into the constitution of the human race, that we have what the Christians call a moral consciousness. That cannot be, says atheism. No, it's just a, a remnant from the programming of a former age. And we've got to re-educate people's values and get rid of those old taboos and so on. That's the idea now. And they speak of an appalling, mythical, mystical God with an obsession with sex. Do away with all that and those standards. There is no such thing as the conscience, they say. Well, that's the view of atheism. Mark you, the result of rewriting society's moral values and turning things upside down so far is hardly promising. There has always been sin. There has always been violence. There has always been fraud. But now it's an art form and it's reached such a scale and such heights of sophistication. Why, it's almost frivolous to remind you that recently we've had in the news a good deal about the shrinking packages. Firms advertising wares that they've produced for years as having been reduced in price. But they haven't been reduced in price very much and they have been reduced much more in the size of the package or the tube or the quantity. And there is this highly inventive fraud going on all the time. Methods of cheating and swindling. 
Well, I don't mean to be talking about this. You know it for yourself. Everywhere we turn, first the banks are in trouble, then some other area of society is in trouble, then the banks again, then some other area of society, then the banks again, and so on. And institutions you look to for integrity are now full of inventive fraud and swindling. So the new standards, the new values, the great list of things that are no longer wrong is not exactly helping society. Of course not. Well, atheism says there is no such thing as the conscience. Well, then where is it? And what is it? Well, it's true that, so far as I know, there is no physical evidence for the conscience. Nobody carrying out any dissection of a brain has ever claimed that this or that part of it is or can be proved to be the home of a conscience. There is no physical evidence for it. And yet, it is so overwhelmingly obvious and easy to prove the existence of a conscience in the way that we shall define it. Well then, what is it? Well, the biblical word, well, the word, Greek word in the New Testament, this is invariably translated, well, all except in two cases, translated conscience is a word which literally means co-perception. That's what it is. It's your co-perception. It's your knowing together. Now, the explanation for this is found in the Bible. Your conscience is something that knows with. And that's very important to understand that. It is not itself your moral consciousness. It's not that. That you have in your constitution. God who has created all people has written into the constitution his standards, the rules of right and wrong. And we know them. The conscience is something else. It knows with that. And what it means is it's like an inner magistrate or an inner policeman, an inner ombudsman that points out to us when we infringe conscience or when our conduct agrees with conscience. It's a co-perception. It knows with. So you have the law of God written in your constitution. There's no question of that. It's rather like this. The government makes the laws, you may say, and the judges apply them. The judges are not the government. They are a separate institution. One makes the law, the other applies it, enforces it, you may say. And it's like that. In your constitution you know the standards of God and your conscience draws attention to them and justifies you or excuses you accordingly. So the conscience is the inner magistrate and it can be stirred. On one occasion the Lord Jesus Christ was confronted by the scribes and the Pharisees and they brought a woman, you know about this I'm sure, who was caught in the act of adultery. And the scribes and the Pharisees were trying to trap the Lord and they brought before him the requirements of the ancient law and they said, should she be stoned? What should be done with her? And you'll remember that what he said to them is, let him that has no sin cast the first stone. And the biblical record tells us in the Gospel of John that they were convicted by their consciences and they slunk out one by one. They had forgotten their own infringement of the moral law of God their own acts of immorality. They were hypocrites, but they had forgotten those things, and they were feeling smug and self-righteous, but their conscience, their inner magistrate, could remind them, and they felt shame, and were quite unable to carry on 
with their efforts to trap the Lord in some way. So the conscience can be aroused. The conscience shows the work of the law, says the Apostle Paul in Romans 2, written in the hearts of people. Their conscience also, he says, bearing witness. So the law is written in the heart and the conscience will at times draw attention to it and give you, shoot you through with a pang of shame or embarrassment. The conscience is like a flashing light if it's working or it's like a siren going off. It's a spasm of discomfort. What are you doing? What are you saying? This is a lie. What are you into? It is a pang of shame or embarrassment. The conscience It's a sense of sin, whether you call it that or not. It's lingering guilt. It's your resident policeman, your conscience, alongside your constitution, drawing attention. It's the candle of the Lord, said King Solomon, searching within and making known to you when you're wrong or out of line. So that's the conscience and it does that and it causes great shame and uh, it speaks sometimes so unexpectedly. But, and this is, well that's really my first point was atheism does away with the conscience. My second point is quite simply, what is it? And I've tried to give you just a few indications. And my third point is this, the conscience is corruptible. It is twistable. You can tamper with it so that you relieve its pangs of conscience and so on. There are many ways in which you can reprogram the conscience, rearrange it. And we do that, all of us, constantly. We allow ourselves to say to conscience, no, that isn't wrong, that's justified, that's right. And to persuade the conscience to back down and to leave off and not to trouble us. We do that. I give an illustration in my little booklet of the case, and I can't remember now how I came by it, but the case of a literary professor. I read it somewhere, and uh, he was a youngish man and very successful, rose to prominence in the academic literary world rapidly in life, But he he was not a a person of high moral values and he'd stolen a book, a famous literary work of great value from an academic library and he'd put his own label over it. He had a fancy label for all the books he possessed and he'd stuck it over the academic library stamp to conceal it completely. And what happened was after some years Somebody was talking about this extraordinary, wonderful book and he said proudly, well, I possess it. And he lent this fellow academic a copy of his precious book. But he didn't examine it before he lent it. And when he got the book back to his horror, he just casually opened the cover and he saw that the original stamp had leached through his label. And it was obvious it was not his book, but that he was a thief. And he was deeply embarrassed and ashamed. Well, the conscience is like that. You can paste something over it. You can tell it it's wrong. You can persuade yourself that you're right and your conscience is unreasonable and out of line. You can smother it, bludgeon it into submission. Make it insensitive, unconscious, strangle it, do what you please with it. But after a time, it's so awkward, it'll speak again. Your reprogramming will never be fully successful. And it'll hurt you and trouble you and convict you all over again. And maybe at the end of life's journey, it'll be doing that over time. And you'll feel the shame and the stab of so much that you've done. You can corrupt the conscience 
and twist it and anaesthetize it, but not forever and not successfully. There are so many examples of this. There are famous cases I could tell you about, but time doesn't permit tonight, of people who after 20, 30 years have been convicted and shamed by their consciences over something they thought they'd left behind, something serious. Even people who've committed or been party to murder and they've had to own up after many, many years and they couldn't live with themselves. The conscience can be smothered, but it will speak again. It's not for nothing, but I'll come to this, that John Bunyan, what a great literary mind he was, the former peddler converted to God who became such a preacher and the writer of the greatest allegories ever in the English language, Pilgrim's Progress and the Holy War. Not for nothing that John Bunyan in the Holy War called the conscience of man's soul Mr. Recorder because the conscience actually remembers what you've done. But we'll come to that. It may be corrupted. You can, you can anaesthetize the conscience simply by persistently ignoring it. Every time it tells you you've lied, or you've cheated, or that outburst of temper was hurtful and unreasonable, or whatever, or you've stolen something, or you've done something that makes you feel dreadfully unclean. You ignore the conscience, just do it again. Ignore the conscience, do it again, do it again. Eventually, the conscience will lie silent. But it'll be rather like a poor child that's been beaten and is whimpering in a corner. It will recover strength and it will speak again and it will speak against you. But you can bring it to silence by just overriding it, ignoring it, by repeated sin, by extreme sin. You get into extreme sin and it will silence the conscience with regard to all the lesser sins. You bombard the conscience with self-justification. That will silence it if you do that for a time. Redraft it in a very determined way. Re-educate it. Try that. It may work for a time. Or here's another way that people have tried. Develop great hostility to the values conscience stands for. Be hostile to those values. Be scornful at them. Hate them. And your conscience will fall in line. And it will fall silent. But in time, if it doesn't speak, it may call, cause you hidden troubles. It may make you very depressed. Now I have to be very careful when I say that because I'm certain that there are many causes of depression. There are many causes of depression other than a bad conscience. There can be body chemistry and all sorts of things that I'm not into understanding. I appreciate that and I don't want to suggest that all people who suffer any form of depression are guilty of something they're suppressing. But it can make you desperately depressed. It is one of those things and it can make you a person who's almost impossible to live with. Such an awkward and touchy individual. And it can make you somebody who, uh, well, you're so ill at ease with yourself and lacking in peace. Dear friends, conscience can cause many an illness. We're told how much illness can be caused by stress. And a troubled conscience is a form of stress, even if it's buried and within. So you never can fight, really reprogram conscience or silence it. But here's another point which I started to mention out of turn, and it's this. Conscience remembers. It is a memory store. And you may not know what is in your conscience, 
Do you have occasions when perhaps uh, you're asleep and you wake up and you think of something? Unpremeditated thinking, and you think back to some past event, and it's something you did. And you shouldn't have done it. And it was a terrible thing to do. And you've successfully forgotten it. And it's out of your head, out of your mind. And it hasn't troubled you for years. And suddenly you're in a cold sweat. It's come back. I did that. And you feel terrible. Has that happened to you? You know, that's just an indication to you that in your subconscious or whatever you like to call it, conscience has stored an entire record and every now and then something will just pop up or pop out. Don't you know that that's telling you there's a whole record there? There's something that will come out against you one day. How much we need the conscience to be purged. How much we need to know that our sins are forgiven because one day in the last day of life we will be so burdened by shame and remorse. Sin and guilt causes amnesia. We forget these things but conscience, Mr. Recorder, has it all and one day it will testify against us. So I come really to the most important point. What about the purging of conscience? Well, it's vital for communion with God. For acceptance by God, your conscience must be purged. Your sin must be forgiven. The record held by conscience must be removed and wiped out. How can you do that? How can you bring that about? Well, it cannot be bought. There's nobody you can pay to cleanse your conscience. There's nothing you can do to get to purge the conscience or to cleanse it. Some people suggest there are things you can do. There is nothing you can do. This is a divine work. It's no good looking out for some priest, some self-proclaimed priest who can prescribe for you some ceremony, some penance, some good deeds and tell you that that will purge your conscience. No such thing. Cannot be done. Not in the Bible, which is our only source of information about the purging of the conscience. There is no body you can pay, no act, no ceremony, no ritual, that's all pantomime before God that can actually remove the burden of guilt and of sin, the whole record of everything we've been and everything we've done and can purge it all from the conscience. Time won't get rid of it. Because you and I forget what we've done, we think that the guilt of sin just goes away. It gets lost in the forgetfulness of time. And the things I did 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago, will never be brought up either in my conscience or against me by God, by anyone. That's what we imagine. But it's not true. In God's moral universe, God has pledged that all sin must be accounted for and it must be punished. And the record is there and it will not go away. And the conscience will acknowledge it and respond to it in the day of judgment. So time will not wash it away. The fallible human memory may but the sin, the guilt, will never be eroded away. I met a man once. He was 69 years of age. He looked at me and he solemnly said, I believe when I am 70, all my guilt will be gone. I believe there is an automatic purging 
of all guilt and sin at the age of 70. I was astonished. I said to him, well, that's very good news if it's true, but where did you get it from? Oh, he said, I thought of it myself. Yes. Well, I pointed out to him he was no authority to determine what God's plans were and what his intention was and what he would do, but he was unimpressed with any argument I advanced. He'd made up his mind. At 70, the burden of sin, the pack, falls away. What nonsense we can tell ourselves. But that's not much difference from thinking all my guilt will just go away. And when I die, I'm going to heaven. I never believed in God, but if he's there, I'm going there. I'm all right. Because I say so. Because I thought of it myself. And there's no trouble. And there's nothing to face. But no dear friends... Our imaginations, there's no auto-release at 70 or 80 or any other age. There's only one way, and it's given here in this verse. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience, purge your conscience. The conscience has to be cleansed. It has to be purged. How is it done? Well, it's done by everything that is on the conscience being taken and a punishment being inflicted. Well, then I'm lost. If everything recorded in my conscience and in the books of God that stands against me must be punished, that's the only way, then I will be in torment eternally. I will be banished from the presence of God and punished forever. Ah, but here is the message of the Bible, that the eternal Son of God, Jesus Christ, has come to bear that punishment in our place. If we're his... If we belong to him, if we're forgiven by him, he bears it in our place. That's the meaning of the verse. How much more shall the blood of Christ, the agonies and sufferings of Christ, when he suffered for sinners on Calvary's cross, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, he was God as well as man. He was pure and holy. He was the only one qualified ever to make an atonement for other people because he had no sin of his own. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience? It purges the conscience because he bears away the penalty and the punishment and the sin and the price. He pays the debt, the debt we owe to God. He carries it away on our behalf. That's what he did on Calvary's cross. That's what he did not just the agony of the nails through his hands and feet and the hanging in the sun, not just the wounds from the flogging that he'd received, but when God the Father put upon him something quite invisible to human eyes, the guilt of the sin of all those who would be forgiven and poured out eternal punishment upon Christ the Saviour compressed into six indescribable hours and he bore that punishment away and paid the debt the sin has gone the punishment has been paid the guilt is no more so the conscience can be purged do you believe that your sin was on Christ, on Calvary's cross, because you believe in him, 
and you trust in him and him alone and you don't trust for a moment in your own imagined deserving or righteousness but you say I trust in the Saviour Jesus Christ the eternal Son of God and I lay my soul at his feet and give my life to him and trust in him and him alone I have heard of his mercy and I have heard his call and I yield my life to him and believe in him I've called upon him for salvation and for forgiveness that's the message of the gospel your conscience is then purged if Christ forgives you and he purges it because he's paid the price he has the right to do it the divine and moral right to cleanse you and though you're still a sinner if you've been saved by Christ oh he changes you greatly but though you still have a sinful heart and commit sins against him your past sin has gone your present sin has gone you'll repent of it as you commit it you'll pray for strength to get better and better and to please him you'll live a different life you'll have different motives you'll have different tastes he'll have changed you and he'll help you and he'll bless you in countless ways but you'll know this that all your sin past, present and future has been borne away already and your conscience is purged and one day you will stand before God and be entirely accepted and welcomed to the eternal home that's the purging of the conscience that's the preciousness that's the value of it you're accepted justified given new life you now know him and walk with him oh someone will say I can see a fault in all this I can see a problem if my sin past present and future I hear what you say the sins I may continue to commit I will be sorry for and I will repent but if my sin past present and future is dealt with the punishment is borne by Christ the debt is paid then isn't that to me a tremendous incentive to sin as I like I haven't got to be judged I haven't got to pay the price I'm off the hook I can now do what I like some people think that that is a valid objection to the gospel of Christ it encourages people to sin well what's the answer to that oh no dear friends it doesn't because when your conscience is purged and when your sin is taken away you're given a new life and your conscience is enlivened and you cannot live like that you cannot think like that you don't want to take advantage of the mercy of God you want to please him and sin that used to be your friend becomes your enemy and you hate it and though you may fall from time to time yet you loathe your sin and you pray to God to help you ever advance in pleasing him that's the answer to that your conscience is purged your sin is forgiven and your life is changed with new desires but friends I've said enough you have a conscience it's inescapable you cannot dismiss it you may try to silence it to reprogram it you'll never be wholly successful all you'll do is drive its troubles down into your subconscious somewhere where it'll be no end of trouble through life and you'll never have peace and happiness and liberty and one day it'll speak against you you need your conscience to be cleansed I cannot do it no person on earth no therapy no technique only Christ the Lord of glory 
can cleanse your conscience. You need him, friends. Let's pray together. O oh God, our gracious Heavenly Father, help us all. Look upon us. Show us our need. Lead us to Christ. Grant, O oh God, the great joy and happiness of coming to peace and rest in him and knowing sin forgiven and newness of life. Grant repentance and faith to every seeking heart. We ask it in the name of our Saviour, for his sake. Amen.